faithful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Without wasting time, I'm going to call upon Brother Johnny to do the way of offering for us this morning. Amen. Lordship, we thank you for your kingship. 
Your blessed name we pray, O oh God, I pray this morning, O oh Lord, that you will anoint my vocal cords, O oh Lord. Anoint my mouth, O oh God, to declare your word to your people. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I yield myself, O oh God, to the leading, O oh Lord, of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you take charge of this meeting. You take charge this morning, take charge of our lives this morning. You are our comforter. You are our helper, our strengthener. You are our teacher. You're, you are indeed the spirit of truth. And I pray this morning, O oh God, by your spirit, you will lead us into all truth. I pray this morning, O oh Lord, that we will have a clearer understanding of the word of God this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, O oh God, we thank you this morning. And we praise you and give you the worship in Jesus' wonderful name. And all the people of God said, Amen. Come and give the Lord praise this morning. Come and you can do better than that. I think you can do better than that. Say thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for giving me life, for giving me peace, for giving me joy. So we thank God for that. The devil is a liar. 
Amen. Amen. So also from the landlord, I spoke to him yesterday and he also extends his apologies. He says to the church, please bear with it. We try and get a plumber out in the week. Amen. So we pray, we trust God and all will be back to normal. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. So that will not hinder the work of God. We'll still preach the gospel. Amen. Praise God. So I'd like you to go with me in your Bibles to the gospel of St. John and chapter number 11. St. John's gospel, chapter 11. Many of you are probably familiar with the portion of scripture that I'll be sharing with you this morning. Amen. About the Lazarus account. The count of Lazarus. Now you can put your name there. This is the Ricardo account. This is the Dolly account. This is the Alicia account. This is the Rodney account. This is the Brendan account. This is the Vusi account. The Jimmy account. Amen. Amen. So many of you are familiar with this, in St. John's Gospel, chapter 11, one of the most amazing accounts. We find it only in the Gospel of John, and I believe this is very, very powerful. John the Apostle had so much revelation of Jesus, and in John's Gospel we find how John reveals Jesus to us as Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus being the Word of God made flesh. This John reveals and shares with us. And I want to read this morning, I'm reading from the Passion Translation. And we're going to start off from verse number one. Now the Bible says, in the village of Bethany, there was a man named Lazarus. You can probably liken it to yourself. In the town of Newcastle, there was a man named Ricardo. Or there was a woman named Lite, a woman named Kivashni. Are you getting what I'm saying? And the Bible goes on to say, and his sisters, Mary and Martha. It's amazing how God knows you, and he knows everything about you, and he knows your family. Yeah. The Bible goes on and it says, Mary was the one who would anoint Jesus' feet with costly perfume and dry his feet with her long hair. One day Lazarus became very sick to the point of death. We all have at some time or the other got to a point where we thought that it was the end. Mm -hmm. Come on somebody. Probably you could be a parent when you look at your child and you look at the way things are going in the world and you think that it's the end for your child. But it's not the end. See, one day Lazarus became very sick to the point of death, so his sister sent a message to Jesus. Lord, our brother Lazarus, the one you love, was very sick. Please come. You see, you sitting here now, you don't know, but there was a time where somebody was watching your life. And somebody was interceding on your behalf. And somebody was praying on your behalf. Yeah. Lord, please help sister so-and-so. Please help brother so-and-so. Lord, please help my daughter. Lord, please help my son. Lord, please help my niece, my nephew. It doesn't matter, but somebody stood in the gap for you. Tell that to your neighbor. Somebody, you are here because of somebody else's intercession. You see, somebody interceded for you. Somebody was woken up at midnight to pray for you. So you are here today because of somebody's intercession for you. 
Here we find the sisters of Lazarus to get the message to Jesus. Lord, our brother Lazarus, not only our brother, but the one you love. And understand, regardless of who you are, regardless of circumstances, regardless of what you look like, God loves you. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. That is the crux of the gospel. It's God's love. For God so loved the world. For God so loved everybody that he gave. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God made a plan. God made a way for you. Talk to me somebody. When the devil was um, trying to get your attention, to get you to think and believe that it is the end of your life, that it is an end, that you've reached a dead end, that there's no other way out. God made a way for you. Tell somebody God made a way for you. The way is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Says Lazarus, our brother Lazarus, the one whom you love. God loves everybody. He loves all people. Come and talk to me, somebody. He loves those who are saved and those who are not yet saved. He loves them too. Amen. You may say, but how despicable, you know, when I look and I see what they are doing. Listen, God still loves the person. He just doesn't love what they are doing. That's why he sent Jesus. So they could get a Jesus encounter and be loosed from that thing. Talk to me, somebody. So they say, he's very sick. Please come. Now when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not the end for Lazarus. This sickness will not end in death for Lazarus, but will bring glory and praise to God. Are you hearing me, somebody? It doesn't matter what comes your way. It is not for death, but it is for the glory of God. It's for the praise of God. In it, God will be glorified. In it, God will be praised. Come and talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Says this sickness will not end in death for Lazarus, but will bring glory and praise to God. The, watch. This will reveal the greatness of the Son of God by what takes place. Hallelujah. The greatness of the Son of God by what takes place. Jesus already knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Come on. He knows the end from the beginning. I mean, even before the sisters came to him, he knew already Lazarus was sick. Yeah. Come and talk to me. And you find verse 5. Now, even though Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he remained where he was for two more days. You see, it's not always about our timing. It's not always about how we or when we want it done. God has his time. And his timing is always perfect. And you may not think it so, and you may not believe it to be so, but listen, God's plan is always just in time. He's always just in time. Talk to me, somebody. So Jesus remained where he was two more days. I imagine that they come and they say, our brother Lazarus, the one whom you love, he's very sick. Jesus, if you don't do something, he's going to die. And Jesus still stays two more days. You see, it's his time. Talk to me. So he remained where he was for two more days. Finally, on the third day, he said to his disciples, I like this, come, it's time to go to Bethany. Come, it's time to go to Bethany. I don't know what you've been trusting God for, believing God for, or crying out unto God for, but Jesus, in his time, he says, come, it's time to go to Newcastle. Come, it's time to go to Mattatelli. Come, it's time to go to Osiswani. Come, it's time to go to Shurebo. Come, it's time to go to Abba Talk to me, somebody. It's time to go. I like those words. Jesus says, come, it's time to go. Hallelujah. 
It's time to go to Bethany. Watch here what the disciples say. But teacher, they said to him. But. <laughs> Jesus already, he said, it's for the glory of God. It's to reveal the greatness of the Son of God. And he says, come now, now it's time to go. You see, he knows when his time, his time, his timing is perfect. His timing is everything. Now his disciples say, but teacher, do, they, do you really want to go back there? It was just a short time ago the people of Judea were going to stone you. Yeah. Wow. Just a time ago, just, just yesterday. Imagine that. Just yesterday, they wanted to kill you. Just yesterday, they wanted to stone you to death. And Jesus replies and he says to them, Are there not twelve hours of daylight in every day? Are there not twelve hours of daylight in every day? You can go through a day without the fear of stumbling when you walk in the one who gives light to the world. I'm going to repeat that. You can go through a day without the fear of stumbling. In other words, without the fear of failing. Without the fear, come and talk to me, of dying. You can face anything when you walk in the one who gives light to the world. Have you, have you considered, this, um, considered this for a moment? If, we, if there was no sun, if there was no sunlight, what do you think would happen around us? It would be dark, am I? Mm -hmm. Now have you ever, I mean, we face this many times. All of a sudden, the lights go out. Eskom comes through. The light goes out. And then you find you're sitting in the house. And what do you do? You're sitting in the dark, but you start groping around. And as you're groping, I mean, you know your house, but you find that as you walk, you start stumbling into some things. You start knocking some things. You see, so it is when you're in the dark. You keep stumbling. There's always a stumbling block. There's always something that hinders your movement. But when the lights are on, when there's light, you can see where you are going. Yeah. When there's light, come on, when there's light, you can face anything. You can find your way in the light. Talk to me, somebody. Now, what Jesus was saying here, I mean, he uses a parable. Are there not 12 hours in the day? So he uses a parable to respond as to why he was not afraid to go back. To go back to where they sought his life. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid of the danger that was lurking. He wasn't afraid. Why? Because it's more than the sun. He is the one who gives the light to the world. He's greater than the sun. He's greater than sunlight. So when you understand the power and the greatness of the one who gives light to the world, you will not be afraid of anything. Come what may, you still stand your ground. Come and talk to me. Because once you know who you are in Christ, once you know who you are in God, you can face anything. You become a Daniel. They'll throw you to the lion's den and you'll be choked. You'll be relaxed. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Jesus goes on and he says, But you will stumble when the light is not in you, for you'll be walking in the dark. That's what I was just explaining to you. Then Jesus added, Lazarus, our friend, has just fallen asleep. Jesus, when the sister sent the message that he was sick to the point of death, Jesus, he already knew everything that would take place. And he says this sickness is not, it will not lead to death. It will not be the end of Lazarus. But it will be for the glorification of God and for the praise of God that the Son of God might reveal the greatness of God. The greatness of 
who he is. And now, Jesus says here, that was our friend has just fallen asleep. In other words, that was the moment, that was the point. Let us close his eyes. So he, listen, God knows you. He knows everything about your life. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, he knows everything about you. God knows everything that's going to happen in your day. I mean, you may get up in the morning and you might say, but my God, what does today hold for me? Listen, God knows everything that the day holds for you. He knows everything that's in store for you. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. So he knows everything. That's why it's so important. Start your day with God. Start your day with God. He knows everything about your day. He knows about the pitfalls that will come your way. But praise God, He knows that in it He'll be glorified. Hallelujah. He says, Let us, our friend, has just fallen asleep. It's time that I go and awaken Him. It's time that I go and awaken Him. You could be the Lazarus now this morning. You could be at the point where you've lost all hope. You could be at the point where you've lost faith. You could be at the point where you've just lost courage. And you've given in to discouragement. But Jesus says, it's time that I go and awaken him. And Jesus is here this morning in his word. He's here to awaken you to who you are. He's here to awaken you to who he is in your life. Talk to me. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the good shepherd. He's a good teacher. Talk to me. He is your life. It's time that I go and awaken him. When they heard this, the disciples replied, Lord, if he's just fallen asleep, then he'll get better. Hallelujah. If he's just fallen asleep, he'll get better. Jesus was speaking about Lazarus' death. See that? That's how when Jesus said, Lazarus, our friend, has just fallen asleep. At that point, he knew Lazarus died. And he knew that now it's time to go and wake him from the dead. The disciples say he'll get better. Jesus was speaking about Lazarus' death, but the disciples presumed he was talking about natural sleep. You see, the things of the spirit are spiritually discerned. The Bible says a natural man cannot receive from God. It's your spirit man that receives from God. It's your spirit man that receives revelation from God. It's your spirit man that receives understanding from God. It's your spirit man that receives enlightenment from God. That's why it's so important for you to walk after the dictates of the spirit of God in you. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. Come on, talk to me somebody. You may say, but how do I do that? By spending time with the Word of God, with the Scriptures. The same Spirit who wrote this Word is the Spirit that resides within you. And as you feed your Spirit with the Word of God, you begin to see things differently. That yes, to your natural mind, it makes no sense. It makes no sense to your natural mind. When you feel the pain in your body, but your spirit says, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. Your spirit says, rise up and start speaking and say, I am the heel of the Lord. Your spirit, man, he's the one that awakens you. It may be something in your knee. Your spirit says, rise up and start speaking to that knee. And you say, in the name of Jesus, you comply with the word of God. I command you to comply. Yes, to your natural mind, it may sound foolish. You see, to the natural man, it's foolish. A man that is not born again, that does not have the spirit of truth in him, does not, because what is the truth? By his stripes, you were healed. You are not the sick trying to be healed. You are the healed keeping sickness away. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. When your spirit man says, now it's time to sow. Your natural man says, oh no, it's my last. How am I going to survive tomorrow? What am I going to do about tomorrow? 
But it's, it's your spirit man that knows that when I sow, I reap. It's your spirit man that understands that when God says, try me in this, God is putting out a challenge to you to say, listen, let us partner together in your finances. You can't do it on your own. But your natural mind says, oh no, this is my last. Oh no, what about this? We are so worried about our reputations that we're not worried about the reputation of God. That God can be glorified in your circumstance. You see that? Your natural, it doesn't make sense to the natural man. It doesn't make sense. But it makes sense to the spirit man. To your spirit man it makes sense. To your spirit man it makes sense. Talk to me somebody. Yes, the doctors may have diagnosed you with a terminal sickness or a terminal disease. A disease that will terminate your life. But your spirit man understands that in Christ I have life. I am not afraid. I'm not afraid. Talk to me, somebody. I'm not worried about the diagnosis because I know that Jesus has healed me. He bore it at Calvary's cross. Hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. Then, watch it. They didn't understand it. They, they thought he's talking about natural sleep. Then Jesus made it plain to them, Lazarus is dead. In other words, let me put it in terms that you understand. Let me come down to your level. Lazarus is dead. You see that? Imagine now, you there, Jesus says, let's go wake up Lazarus. He said, my Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll get better. And then he tells you, wakey, wakey, he's dead. I mean, a natural person then, I'm sure the disciples were, he's going to wake a dead man. We just heard now, the man died. What are we still going there for? And Jesus, they were probably questioning that because Jesus goes on now and he says, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't dead. I'm glad I wasn't there when he died. I'm glad I wasn't there. Because now you have, watch it, I like this song. Because now you have another opportunity to see who I am so that you will learn to trust in me. Yeah. You see, that's the God we serve. He's the God of the second chance. He's a God of opportunity. God, come on, talk to me, somebody. You may see that something has happened in your life and you think you are all alone. No, you are not alone. He has said, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. He is with you. Amen. And he says to his disciples, I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there. Because now you'll get a revelation, you'll get an understanding of who I am. Yes, you've been walking around with me. You see, and that can happen sometimes. It's familiarity. His disciples were probably becoming too familiar with him. They were becoming too familiar. And when you're too familiar, you cannot receive. You see, that spirit of familiarity can receive nothing from God. That's why he says, I'm glad I wasn't there. Because now, when I do go, you get an understanding of who I am. Not only that, but you learn to trust in me. You will learn to trust in me. Things happen in our lives, yes. But those things happen so that we may know who he is. Those things happen so that we may learn to trust him more. Oh, talk to me somebody. Hallelujah. Then he says, come, let's go and see him. So Thomas, oh Thomas, 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 Thomas nicknamed the twin. <laughs> See, Th Thomas even had a nickname, the twin. They nicknamed him the twin. Maybe because he was the direct opposite of everything that, you know, that, they would, that Jesus would say and that Jesus would do, he had the opposite. I mean, when the disciples said, Jesus is risen from the dead. What did Thomas say? Unless I see, I'll not believe. You see, Thomas was the opposite. He was the one that said, I will not come 
my chickens before my eggs hatch. He was the one that would say, seeing is believing. Come and talk to me. It's more blessed to believe and not have seen than to see and then believe. There's a great blessing in believing it before it happens. There's a great blessing in that. Talk to me. So Thomas was nicknamed the twin. He remarked to the other disciples and said, let's, let's go so that we can die with him. Jesus was just talking about life. He was just saying, listen, I'm going to wake up Lazarus. And then he tells them, listen, Lazarus is dead, but let's go and see him. And here Thomas says, let's go and die with him. Because they were all conversing among themselves. They wanted to stone him to death. Let's go. We're also going to die. So Thomas was probably saying this, that listen, Lazarus, we just heard Lazarus is dead. So it's Lazarus' funeral, so it's probably going to be Jesus' funeral and our funeral. So let's go and die. Let's go be dead. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You see, you need to get rid of the, Lazar of the, of the Thomas in your life. Get rid of the Thomas in your life. Thomas is a doubter. Thomas is a pessimist. He's pessimistic. He's not optimistic. He, he doesn't look forward to the future. When he sees the future, he sees a dead end. You've got to let go of the Thomas in your life. Now, when they arrived at Bethany, watch it, they arrived at Bethany, which was only about two miles from Jerusalem. Jesus found that, watch, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. They sent the message to Jesus. Lord, our brother Lazarus, the one whom you love, is very sick. Please come. Jesus, listen, Jesus' response most certainly was, I'm on my way. I'm coming. But they did. They went home. They saw, oh, Jesus is not coming. Ah, oh, Lord, Lazarus closed his eyes. Ah, oh, no, it's the end now. Let's bury him. No waiting for Jesus. You see, that's what happens sometimes in our lives. We pray and we trust God to come through. And then when God doesn't come through at your time, you think now that it's the end. No, it's not the end. You ought to trust Him more. You ought to praise Him more. You ought to, come and talk to me, you ought to praise Him more. You ought to trust Him more. You ought to believe Him more. You ought to press on more. What happens with most people? They give up. They just at the brink of getting to the breakthrough. They give up. I'm reminded of the account in the scriptures. The one whom the prophet instructed to start shooting the arrows. And then he shot, shot, and then he stopped. And then the man of God asked him, why did you stop? Because if you continued, you would have killed all the enemies. But now you've left room for one. You see, you've got to press on in the things of God. Don't give up. Tell your neighbor, don't give up. Press through. Yeah. If it means you must pray more, you pray more. If it means you must praise Him more, you praise Him more. If it, if it, come and talk to me. You've got to trust Him more. You've got to believe Him more. You've got to hold on to him even more tightly. Listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, in the day and age we are living in, you've got to today, today, you've got to hold on to God more tighter than you were holding on yesterday. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You've got to hold on to God tighter today than you were holding on to him yesterday. You've got to pray unto God more today than you were praying unto him yesterday. You've got to come and talk to me. You've got to believe in more today than you were believing in yesterday because that is the secret. You've got to press through. You've got to persevere in the things of God. Say amen, somebody. Many friends of Martha and Mary had come from the region to console them over the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was approaching the village, 
she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said, Jesus, she, Martha says to Jesus, says, my Lord, if only you had come sooner. Wow. If only you had come sooner. Lord, you're too late now. Come and talk to me. Hallelujah. Plenty of you have probably heard those words. When you, when you, you know, um, when you've arrived somewhere and they say, ah, you're too late. Sometimes the enemy can play with your mind and get you to think that it's too late now to do anything. It's too late now. It's too late. Tell your neighbor, it's never too late. It's never too late. God is bigger than time. He's bigger than our chronological time. God lives in the time zone called eternity. It is eternal. Talk to me, somebody. It is eternal. God operates in eternity. And He is eternity. Eternal life is in Him. Now Martha says, this is Martha now. Lord, if you'd come sooner, my brother wouldn't have died. Imagine that she's blaming Jesus for his death. Because you didn't come when I called you, look now, he died. You see, and sometimes when you pray and you trust God and you believe God for something, the enemy, can, the enemy operates with suggestion. Don't give in to suggestion. Don't have any conversation with him. You tell him, get behind me, Satan. Thou savest the things of the world. Thou savest not the things of God. He'll come with suggestion. Oh, it's too late now. Oh, why don't you just give up now? Ah, oh, it's the end now. Remember Job's wife? Why don't you just curse God and die? Job says, You silly woman, you speak as those foolish people. Though he slay me, I will serve him. Though he slay me, I will praise him. Talk to me. We need that type of attitude today. We need to be people of integrity. The Bible says in all these things that happened to Job, Job held his integrity. That's one thing that we lack as people of integrity. Talk to me, somebody. My brother wouldn't have died. But I know that if you were to ask God for anything, he would do it for you. Yeah, it may be too late. If you were here, you wouldn't have died. But if you were to ask God for anything, He would do it for you. Jesus says to her, Your brother will rise and live. I like that. Your brother will rise and live. She replies, Yes, I know you will rise, you will rise with everyone else on resurrection day. You see, so when she said, I know that if you ask God of anything, He will answer you. If you pray to God, He will answer you. She, was, she, she didn't really believe that He could raise Him from the dead. She believed that if He was there while Lazarus was alive on his sickbed, and Jesus could ask God then, then God would answer. But now God will not answer because Lazarus is dead, he's buried, they had his funeral. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise and live. And she says, she says, yes, I know he will rise with everyone else on the resurrection day. Uh, you will rise with everyone else on the last day. Other translations say on the last day. When it's everybody else's last day, you'll get an opportunity. Jesus responds to her. And he says, Martha, you don't have to wait until then. The message Bible says, why wait till then? Why wait till the last day? I am here now. He says, why wait? Why wait for the last day? Why wait for that day? I am here now. It's like many Christians. We pray to our Father. We say, thy kingdom Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. We say that prayer. Thy will be done. 
kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That means that whilst you are living on earth, you can also experience heaven on the earth. Amen. You can experience the reality of heaven on the earth. You can enjoy it on the earth. But many believers, they say, oh, one day when Jesus comes to fetch me, when the Lord takes me home, I'll be at peace. You can experience his peace while you're here on earth. You can experience his peace. You can experience his joy. You can experience his love on a daily basis. Talk to me, somebody. You can experience the resurrection power of Christ in your life on a daily basis. Not just once a year when we celebrate this God. No, when you wake up tomorrow, Monday, you're walking in resurrection power. When you wake up on Tuesday, you're walking in resurrection power. When you wake up on Wednesday, you're walking in resurrection power. You rise up in resurrection power. You walk in resurrection power. And this thing is for eternity. Are you hearing me, somebody? Hallelujah. He says, Martha, you don't have to wait until then. I am. I am. He, in other words, he's telling her, when he says, I am, the very man, when he just said, I am, that should have taken her breath away. He was saying to her, I am the living God. I am the resurrection. I am the life. But you don't have to wait till then. I'm here now. You don't have to wait till then, brother. You don't have to wait till then, sister. Jesus says, I'm here now. I'm here now. I'm with you now. I'm here now. I'm here to change the course of your life. I'm here to change the course of your life. It means that if you thought your life was going the wrong way, he says, I'm here to make it right again. I'm here to straighten those parts. Life, 
this ending. But resurrection overcomes. Life is the power to exist. But resurrection is the power to conquer all, even death itself. See that? Resurrection. So God has given you resurrection life, resurrection power. And that power within you causes you to overcome. That it doesn't matter what comes your way. You are more than a conqueror through him who loves you. You've been made more than a conqueror through him who loves you and gave himself up for you. Hallelujah. We need as believers to learn to live in Christ. I shared with you last week about living in the anointed one and his anointing. That was God's plan purpose for humanity. We must come to a place where we can learn to live in Christ because Christ is our life. Get to a place where you live in Him, where you're living in the vine.
remember in Mark's Gospel the man Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, who stood by the side of the road and shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And the more he shouted, the more the people silenced him. The more he shouted, the people were telling him, keep quiet. Silence, keep quiet. But he continued to shout. You see, many times in your life, the enemy will try to silence your faith. Because he knows when he silences your faith, you can do nothing. When he silences your faith, you die. Faith without works is dead. He knows if he can get you out of operating in faith, he knows you're dead. Because it's your works that perfect your faith. It's your works that activate the power of your faith. But he continued shouting. Eventually, he got Jesus' attention. Jesus stopped. And Jesus called him. And the people were saying, the master is calling you. He's calling you. And he left his beggarly garments and he ran to Jesus. But here we have Martha coming to Mary. He's saying the master is here and he's looking for you. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, you and I once were lost. We now found. And everything else that we lost in our lives, Jesus came to find us and give it to us. Man, what a powerful word that Jesus is here and he's looking for you. He's asking for you. Amen. When we hear those words, our response should be like Mary. Our response should be like Mary. When Mary heard that, she didn't continue hanging around with the mourners. The Bible says she hurried away. She sped away. She sped towards him. We need to hurry towards Jesus. Not run from him, but run to him. Run to him. Hallelujah. she ran towards him, she found him. When Mary heard this, the Bible says when Mary heard this, she quickly went off to find him. Faith causes you to act. Faith causes you to leave the natural and go for the supernatural. Faith causes you to leave the ordinary and go for the extraordinary. For Jesus was lingering outside the village at the same spot where Martha met him. At the same spot. Hallelujah. When Mary's friends who were comforting her noticed how quickly she ran out of the house, they followed her assuming that she's going to the tomb. They thought she was so grieved she's running to the tomb. She didn't run to the dead. No, she ran Because those who are dead are in the tomb. 
Let the dead bury their dead. You understand that? Those dead end things, leave them. Run to him, the life giver. Run to Jesus. They thought she's going to the tomb of her brother to mourn him. When Mary finally found Jesus outside the village, she fell at his feet in tears and said, Lord, if only you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Same response as Martha. And when Jesus looked at Mary and saw her weeping at his feet, and all her friends who were with her grieving, he shuddered with emotion. He shuddered with emotion. The Greek word used here is the word Elebrimesato. Elebrimesato. It means indignant and stirred with anger. Jesus was not angry at the mourners. Not at all. He was angry over the work of the devil in taking the life of his dear friend Lazarus. You understand that? He was angry. How could, how dare Satan take the life of my friend? How dare he does it? I am the life giver. I have come to give them life and give them more abundantly. Yes, Satan, you have, you are, come on, you are a thief. You only come to steal, to kill and destroy. But I have come the time that they might, have, they might have life and have it more abundantly. He wasn't angry that they were mourning. He wasn't angry at, at the sisters. He was angry at the devil. Anger. Holy anger. Holy rage. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says he shuddered with emotion and was deeply moved with tenderness and compassion. And he said to them, and he's saying it to you this morning, where did you bury him? Where did you bury him? You the one who buried him. Your joy that was taken from you, where did you bury it? The peace, the peace that I've given you, where did you bury it? Where did you bury the hope I gave you? Where did you bury the dreams that I gave you? Many of you have dreams. God gave you dreams. Dreams you held on to. But because of circumstances and things that have happened in your life, so many things have overwhelmed you. Situations have overwhelmed you. You've taken those dreams. You've taken those desires. You've taken those hope. You've taken that faith. And you've buried it. You've been even buried. You've been. And he says now, where did you bury him? Where did you bury him? It's like when God was walking in Eden. Walking in the cool of the day, the Lord was walking. The Father of creation walking. Walking to have fellowship, to have intimacy with the man he created. The animals cannot have fellowship with God as we have fellowship. for us to enjoy. I mean, in enjoying those things, to have fellowship with Him, to glorify Him in those things. All those things were created for His glory. That's like Israel, when God said to them, when you leave Egypt, each man, each woman will borrow from their neighbor. They'll borrow jewelry. They'll borrow gold, silver. They will plunder the Egyptians. They are going to come out with great spoils from the Egyptians. They will come out with those spoils from Egypt because I am the Lord. And those spoils that you are taking, that's the wealth of the righteous that's laid up with the wicked. That wealth is supposed to be transferred to the righteous so that you use that wealth to build me a house, to build me a sanctuary. But what did Israel do? They took the they took the same sulfur, they took the same jewels, and they created for themselves an idol. When 
God was looking to have fellowship and to be glorified in those things. They used those things and they made those things God. It's like so many people, they trust God and they believe God and when God comes through for them, they forget about God. They forget about the God that saved them from their poverty. They forget about the God that saved them when they were supposed to die. God gave them life again. They forget about it and they use that life to spoil it on themselves. There are many people, many people, I've seen it in my life. You pray with them. You trust God with them. You believe God for them. And God comes through. And when God comes through, what God has blessed them for, blessed them with the answer that God has given them, becomes God to them. Now they don't need God. They don't need the church. They don't need anything because they become a God unto themselves. They dictate when they will pray. They dictate when they will go to church. They dictate when they will praise God and when they won't. He says, where did you bury him? God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam. Adam. Where are you? Where are you today? Adam says, Lord, I'm hiding. You're hiding? You're hiding? See, that's the first mention of fear in the Bible. I'm hiding. Have you eaten from the tree I told you not to eat of? I'm hiding because I'm naked. Who told you you're naked? Who told you? Who told you you couldn't, you'll never amount to anything? Who told you those dreams will never come true? Who told you that those hopes will not come to pass? Who told you that? If God has told you something, my brother, my sister, it will come to pass. There's no demon in hell, no devil can stop it. If God said it, that settles it. When Jesus said, we'll go to wake up Lazarus, that word, the very point where Jesus said, we're going to wake him up, that word was settled in heaven. That word was settled in heaven, and there's nothing that the devil could do to change it. Yes, he thought he had the upper hand when he took the life of Lazarus, but now Jesus comes, and he says, where did you bury him? They say, Lord, come with us and we'll show you. Then tears stream down the face of Jesus. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus went. Seeing Jesus weep caused many of the mourners to say, look how much he loved this Lazarus. You see, there were those that said, see how much he loved him. Then there were those who began to question and say, isn't this the one who opens the blind eyes? Why didn't he do something man from dying. Isn't this the one? I mean, even, even on the cross, they posed a question to him and they said, physician, heal yourself. You heal others, you can't heal yourself. You see that many times people question that. They say you pray for others and things happen for others. You can help others, but you can't help yourself. I don't need to help myself because I have a God Amen. Are you getting what I'm saying? Then Jesus, with intense emotions, came to the tomb, a cave with a stone placed over its entrance. Jesus said to them, Roll away the stone. Remove the doubt. Remove the fear. Remove the anxiety from your life. Remove the unbelief. Jesus, when in saying that, Jesus is saying, I'm about to call those things that be not as though they were. Are you getting what I'm saying, somebody? He says, remove away the doubt. Remove away the fear. Remove away the unbelief. 
because I'm about to do something. I'm about to call those things which be not as though they will. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter number 4, I'm going to read from verse 17. This is how the message Bible puts it. He says, we call Abraham father, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something, watch it, God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in scripture, God saying to Abraham, I set you up as father of many nations. Abraham, watch out, Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do, raise the dead to life. What the word makes something out of nothing. Woo! Glory! God can do something from your nothing with only a word. If you only have a word from God, you have all you need. Then that's the come and talk to me. Remember the centurion who came to Jesus and he says, Oh master, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. I need somebody in this place that says, Lord, I'm coming to this place. If it's just for a word, I won't leave you until I receive that word. Hallelujah. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed God anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. That's how we ought to live our lives, brothers and sisters, is on the basis of what God has said he will do and not on what we can do. And so he was made father of a multitude of peoples. God himself said to him, You're going to have a big family, Abraham. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say it's hopeless. This hundred-year-old body could never father a child. Nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't watch it. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise, asking cautiously, skeptical questions. Abraham was not a man who took told the promises of God. Oh, I must walk on eggs and I must tread carefully. Because I don't know if I can trust this thing. I don't know if I can believe this thing. No! He was a man of faith. The Bible says Abraham was strong in faith. He started not at the promises of God to unbelief, but was made strong in faith. Giving glory unto God. He staggered not. The only time you stagger is when you're in the darkness. When you're in the darkness, you stagger and you stumble. But when you're in the light, I say when you're in the light, you don't talk to him. It's like somebody who comes home. They come home very late at night. Especially men. Especially men. I mean, you're watching me. Especially you. You come home late at night. And you insert the key slow. And when you think it's making a noise, you hold on. Look around. And the dog is trying. Turn the handle and you get in the house and then the wife has turned the kitchen around oh. the furniture oh. <laughs> and took <laughs> and you took toe. Man, you become a thief in your own house. <laughs> How stupid! How stupid! Man, I don't care what time I come home, it's my house, I open the door, whether it's two o'clock in the morning, I'm walking in, it's my house. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Sometimes I've gone to pray for somebody, or I'm gone to work, and I come home late at night, or early hours of the morning, I'm not going to worry about, oh, oh, you 
You know, I'm, I'm not scared to wake them up. No, I'm not. They must know. Daddy's home. Everything's okay. We need some men to take over their houses. Come and talk to me, somebody. Abraham didn't tiptoe at the promises of God. Tell your neighbor I'm not going to tiptoe. Hallelujah. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise, asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God, sure that God would make good on what he had said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now when Jesus says, roll away the stone, Martha says, what Lord? It's been four days since he died. By now his body is already decomposing. Jesus looked at her and said, Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that if you will believe in me, you will see the glory of God? And I like how the passion puts it. He says, Didn't I tell you that if you believe in me, you will see God unveil his power? God unveiled his power. So they rolled away the heavy stone. Jesus gazed into heaven and said, Father, thank you. Father, thank you that you've heard my prayer. For you listen to every word I speak. Now, so that these who stand here with me will believe that you have sent me to the earth as your messenger. I will use the power you have given me. That is resurrection power. Resurrection power, brothers and sisters, is released when we give thanks to God. When you give thanks to God, you release resurrection power. Jesus stood at Lazarus' tomb and gave thanks, then commanded him to arise. He first gave thanks, and then he commanded Lazarus to arise. Hallelujah. Giving thanks to God has more power than you can ever imagine. My question to you is, have you stopped to give God thanks for today? Have you stopped for a moment to give him thanks for today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then with a loud voice, Jesus shouted with authority, Lazarus, come out of the tomb. Lazarus come forth. He spoke, he released faithful words. The words of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Then in front of everyone, Lazarus who had died four days earlier, slowly hobbled out. He still had grave clothes tightly wrapped around his hands and feet and covering his face. And Jesus said unto them, Unwrap him and let him loose. Loose him and let him go. Hallelujah. Loose him and let him go. From that day forward, many of those who had come to visit Mary believed in Jesus, for they had seen with their own eyes this amazing miracle. May God cause you to be a sign and a wonder to many. May he cause you to be a sign and a wonder to many, Amen. to the millions and trillions of people around you. May God cause you to be a sign and a wonder. May God leave them in awe of his awesomeness. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So it's time that you come forth. Tell your neighbor, I'm coming forth. I'm coming forth. I'm coming forth. I'm not staying here. I'm not staying here in the tomb. I'm coming forth. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Your yesterday's in the tomb. Don't visit it. Your tomorrow's in your womb. It's waiting. It's full of possibility. Full of life. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Say I'm full of life. I'm full of, I'm full of expectation. I'm full of expectation of good. God has his eye upon me. Hallelujah. Amen. And because his eye is upon me, I will only see good. I will only see good. All the days of my life are in the hands of my creator. My tomorrow is in his hands.
hands. My life is in his hands. My family is in his hands. Hallelujah. Give God praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let us stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for resurrection power. I want you to meditate on this. Resurrection power. Resurrection power. Every day. Every day. Walk in the power of His resurrection. There's such great power that's available to you and I. Are you going to believe the circumstances or believe the things that are happening around you or are you going to believe the Word of God? Whose report would you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Thank you.